a very great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, and welcome uh, Boi Kim Cheng to uh, NIE to give, um, I think it's about the fifth in a series of talks about poetry, Singaporean poetry in the making from manuscript to uh, finished poem. Um, Boi Kim Cheng, though he's left Singapore perhaps over a decade ago, is probably seen as one of Singapore's most important um, poets. He's uh, published several collections of poetry, his most recent being uh, Clear Brightness. He's also uh, recently produced a very interesting, a very moving travel memoir we called uh, Between Stations, which is available in all good libraries here, I've checked, <laughs> so uh, well worth a read. And uh, so without further ado, perhaps just we'll give a welcome to Odin. Uh, thanks, Angus, <coughs> and, and thank you all for uh, being here. Um, I, at first, I thought it might be a bit self-indulgent to talk about my second book, uh, Another Place, and um, to kind of revisit those poems and, and revisit that young man who wrote those poems uh, all those years ago. Um, I thought, you know, um, yeah, may, maybe it was just a bit of nostalgia on my part. On my part. But, um, you know, um, since, uh, you know, this text has been uh, on the A-level curriculum for the last, I don't know, six, seven years, I um, thought it might be useful to the teacher trainees, you know, um, if you had to kind of deal with it. Uh, I know that it's uh, drawn quite a few uh, fan mail and also hate mail. <laughs> um, I uh, learned that one of the A-level students after the exams actually went to the Singapore River and, and threw it into the river. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so, yeah, that was uh, very flattering. You know, I think <laughs> that, don't think that can be a better kind of a homage to the river and to, to, uh, yeah, to what I've been trying to do, you know, um, acknowledgement of what I've been trying to do. So, uh, yeah. Um, I guess looking back, uh, you know, you kind of a, a middle-aged writer looking back at his uh, youthful work, you tend to be a bit uh, maybe kinder, you know, than, um, and you tend to kind of uh, maybe excuse all the flaws and, you know, and not say that you know I could have done this better, you know, and, and this shouldn't have gone to print, you know. I mean, there there are poems there that I'll be embarrassed to publish now, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I think as a collection, what I like as a reader about it, you know, um, as, as a reader, you know, trying not to kind of think that he's, he's the author, you know, is the uh, youthfulness and um, I guess the word for it is ardor. And ardor is something that I've you know, missed all these years, you know, as you grow, we become a lot more cynical, you know, <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, all the belief and all the passion that you've, you've had, you know, as a young man or as a young woman, you know, they somehow, you know, yeah, leak away, you know, through the years of, uh, yeah, having a family and, you know, settling down and, well, just growing old. So, uh, you know, to kind of uh, touch this book again after all these years. For, for many years, I never looked at it because I had this superstition that, you know, I shouldn't look, at, look back at what you've done. You know, you just, should just move ahead, move forward. But uh, in the last few years, I've kind of dug up a copy and, and, and kind of uh, looked at it again. And yeah, it was uh, quite, uh, in many ways, uh, hardening and, and quite, uh, affirming, you know, to feel again that sense of ardor and that sense of, uh, well, you know, I was looking for a kind of purity in those days, you know, because uh, as a young poet, I thought I had a mission, you know, and maybe a kind of spiritual mission to make sense of what was happening around me uh, in Singapore to myself and in the wider world. Um, so, you know, the collection 
was uh, it came out in it came out in one uh, very intensive uh, spell, you know, uh, all the poems after a trip to India. So um, I guess as a young man, I had a lot of burning questions in those days, and uh, you know, questions I guess you know which cannot be answered, you know. And and as Rilke says, you know, the thing is to learn to ask those questions, you know, even though uh, the answers may never find us, you know. So the the these poems are a way to frame those questions, I guess, you know, about who I was and and why I hated Singapore that much, you know, at that time, and my quarrel with Singapore and, and I guess with myself, you know, and um, yeah, so I, I, I like to think that it wasn't just kind of angsty poems, uh, you know, um, although a lot of, uh, quite a few A-level students seem to <laughs> kind of think so. Uh, um, I, I like to think that there's something more to them, you know, that they are perhaps soundings, you know, uh, an attempt to go to the age of what I I knew at that time, and perhaps you know, take soundings of what was unknown to me, you know. And, and for me, poetry has always been a kind of a more about you know this process of discovery, you know. Uh, I mean, why write if you know the answers, right? So um, yeah, it was uh, kind of a a way to, I guess, uncover the questions, you know, and maybe travel with them, you know. Um, so that that journey, that Indian journey, all those years ago, was, I guess, a pivotal point in my quest, and you know, um, and it formed the core of the collection. Uh, and Calcutta, especially to me, uh, has become a kind of spiritual center of my work as well as my life, I guess. Uh, I've come back to it again and again uh, here in these poems and also in my memoir um, and then also and also in the latest uh, poem that uh, that I've published. So um, when I landed in Calcutta you know, all those years ago, um, I had no idea where I was going um, and what I was trying to do. And I, you know, this, this was the pre-internet age and, you know, travel was quite different, you know, from what it is now, you know. And, the, you know, um, there was a lot of, a uh, um, lot more unknown out there, you know. And um, I guess, you know, I've, I've read, read about the city, you know, I've seen pictures and I've seen that dreadful movie, um, The City of Joy, was it? <laughs> um, and, but nothing quite prepared me for, you know, yeah, you know, being there, you know. And it, was, it wasn't so much a poverty, you know, I had kind of romantic ideals and Romantic images of myself working, you know, volunteering for Mother Trees at Mother, Mother Teresa's and, and working for this guy called Jack Prager, you know. But uh, it was it was a, strangely a sort of homecoming as well. I don't know uh, that first day arriving in Calcutta at, in the evening, you know, kind of a twilight uh, uh, time, and it was winter, and you know the smells uh, being greeted by those smells and and um, the colours. You know, so I guess at that age, your senses were like heightened. You know, you were kind of alive to everything, you know. Uh, anything could touch you off, you know, um, your youthful imagination. And so that, that encounter, I guess, you know, I don't know. Um, it was, uh, I guess, if you can call it life-changing, you know. Um, um, it gave me a sense of deja vu, you know, like I've been there before, maybe in a previous life, you know, and 
and maybe a glimpse of Singapore back in the 60s, you know, um, when uh, you still had all those old streets and bazaars and Change Alley and I promise not to talk about Change Alley today. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, um, and, um, and life was a lot more intimate in those days, I guess, you know, and, and I, I think it gave me a taste of that. It kind of jogged my memories of what Singapore is like um, as well. So that sense of deja vu, um, yeah, it kind of was quite exhilarating, you know, that first uh, night in Calcutta. Um, and um, I guess, uh, you know, sharing a, a, a dorm room with, uh, you know, some of these backpackers, um, you know, and so, um, yeah, there was a sense of possibility that, you know, there was a lot ahead to kind of encounter and, and you know, um, and that the road ahead was going to be bring a lot of uh, um, surprises and, and, you know, new knowledge. And so, you know, I spent a week there and, um, and, and then it hit me, you know. Um, I suppose Calcutta has changed a lot. I mean, my last visit was just uh, maybe six, seven years ago, but by then it had changed a lot, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, the being kind of a, you know, docked by, a, you know, a mob of uh, child beggars and, and, uh, and then, you know, um, seeing those, um, you know, um, without, you know, those who were deliberately kind of handi kind of uh, handicapped and whose limbs were kind of amputated, you know, just to make them better beggars, and and then it was just and and you know it was just um, things that well, you know, again you've seen it before, you you uh, know about that, you 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 know you're braced for that, but nothing quite uh, was, you know. Yeah, the, you know, just a real thing, you know. Um, so, um, and this station, the train station, Howrah Station, um, uh, at that time, um, you know, um, uh, the last time I went back, you know, they cleaned it up, but uh, it was quite a revelation, you know, going to get a train ticket and, you know, seeing the uh, waiting hall just filled with... Uh, all these bodies, you know, this, all the homeless who have uh, kind of sought shelter there. And um, so I just couldn't believe it, you know. Um, and, um, and then, you know, walking, um, just walking around um, and, you know, you see occasional, the occasional um, cops, you know, on the street and nobody cares, you know, nobody cared, like, enough to kind of... Uh, um, find out what was wrong, you know, or, or whether, you know, the person was dead or whatever, you know. So, um, yeah, life was cheap, I guess, you know, in that sense. And, but uh, I guess all those uh, few months of uh, very intensive, and, and, and I had a lot of energy, a lot of drive, you know, and I guess I wanted to push myself, you know, I was doing very, very kind of a, a kind of very intensive and, and feverish, <coughs> frenetic kind of traveling. You know, I wanted to push myself and test myself, and and and, and also, perhaps, you know, caught this state of exhaustion. You know, which is not very different from a state of ecstasy. You know, uh, and this state of just being lifted out of yourself. And and I suppose in a way, that's why we travel to be taken out of ourselves, you know, to be lifted out of our, you know, kind of boring and, and you know, familiar uh, contexts and lives, you know, and to experience a moment or an encounter that perhaps, you know, shows us something different. You know, I guess it's, it's about crossing boundaries, you know, uh, traveling, that you cross from one state to another and from you know, one part of yourself to another, and and writing is a lot like that. You know, writing is a lot like traveling. You know, it's about yeah, boundary crossing. You know, 
uh, taking a risk, you know, and uh, not knowing what's on the other side. And, and so when I came back, um, I mean, I, I didn't take notes or, you know, write poems when I was uh, on the road. Do I wrote a lot of letters back home. Yeah, it was good, the letter writing age, you know, and you actually really communicated, you know, not just with, you know, the people back home, but, you know, in writing those letters, you were kind of, uh, yeah, trying to get in touch with yourself as well. Um, so when I came back, uh, yeah, there were, I was very restless, and um, I knew I had been backpacking a lot of questions and um, a lot of kind of, uh, yeah, um, unanswerable questions, you know, uh, in me that I, I had to face. And so I, uh, you know, I sat down to write and then yeah, it started coming out and I couldn't, I couldn't stop, you know, for about six seven week, weeks, you know, I just couldn't stop. I, um, it was like I was possessed, you know. And I think I missed that, that state of being possessed. You know, I have never written like that since, you know, which is, I guess, why this book is special to me, you know. Although I've, I've kind of, uh, a lot of poems, as I said, are flawed, highly flawed, and, and um, you know, I, and, um, but uh, I guess when I recall that state of being possessed, as though I, were, I was a kind of vessel you know, through which the poems were um, emerging. So that, that, that was uh, something special, you know, and I guess we all write because of that, to get that sense of high, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it was better than taking marijuana. Yeah. And I, I have taken that on a few occasions. <laughs> um, and so what came up was this, you know, these scraps of poems, and, and um, I really love writing on, you know, just writing like that in those days and, and, and trying to deci decipher my handwriting <laughs> when it came to typing them out. Um, so I think, you know, writing them out like that rather than, you know, I mean, we didn't have computers in those days, right? Um, rather than typing them in, it gave you a sense of connectedness to, to your work, you know, this sense of being in touch, this sense of immediacy, you know, which I think is lost, you know, before the screen or the keyboard, you know. So, um, yeah, you know, um, poems came out and, um, you know, and within two months I had a book, you know, so um, maybe I could read um, this first poem in the collection. And, and so you can see that it came out. Um, uh, there's an early draft of it here. Um, so it was, it was just like that. And if you want to pass it. Um, I mean, it didn't come out kind of uh, finished or, you know, I still had to kind of revise and rework. And as I tell my students, you know, the real writing starts when you revise. You know, that's when the real writing starts. And, but uh, getting the first lines down, you know, that's a good start, you know. And then you try to see where you can go from there. Um, and again, you know, having a pen and uh, or pencil and paper, you know, that's the best way to go, you know. So, um, I'll read you this first poem. I haven't read it for a long time, so. Um, again, I would be very embarrassed now to kind of, uh, you know, some of the images here, I think they are overwritten. Uh, but then, there were the, there, there was the response of a young man, you know, um, to what he saw. Um, so, this is the train station in Calcutta, the Howrah station. To purchase a ticket out, I picked my way through the carnage, sidestepping souls felt at one wild stroke, reduced to withered stalks scattered between puddles of excrement. The leveller is 
working over time here, tireless, laying out a field of maimed mortals, half killed, untended, unfinished, his indiscriminate scythe littering with travail the pilgrim's path. Like, it, like an adroit footballer, I dribble my laundered self past the tackles, eluding the lunging pleas for mercy, warding off eyes which drew the heart into their, their dark pits. This is not a waiting hall. There is no destination for this unfit for travel. It is a terminal ward. Enough revelation to stop all seekers carrying urgent requests for truth in beauty and beauty in truth in their tracks. What are we doing here? This is the right address, the capital of God, art's proper haunt. If poetry could drum up courage, correct the economists, reform the politicians, and bake a million loaves, my presence here needs no apology. But who eats poetry? This morning, I made a detour to the museum. A man was on the pockmark pavement outside. If you can call him a man, you may as well consider him an artist. Legs disappeared into the earth, and short clubs for arms, fingers, no longer than the broken pastels they held. Oblivious to the scorching sun, wrapped in clouds of fumes and noise, he laid out our Lord Jesus with a sacred heart, smiling, peaceful on the uneven ground. Consummate attention, necessity fusing prayer and art in perfect calm. What I lack glowed in him. He rubbed off the ages, precise, exacting, insistent on clarity of vision, and went on to produce a youthful Mary from a soiled picture given perhaps by the sisters at a mission to carry him through and learn his and earn his daily bread with. I tossed an offering. The rupee rolled onto the bleeding heart, its dull gleam settling almost soundlessly home, waking echoes in an unplugged conscience. So I guess, um, yeah, you know, this, the image of this uh, limbless man, you know, um, kind of a painting with pastels, this, um, the sacred heart, you know, um, Jesus and his sacred heart on the, on the pavement in the hot sun, in the boiling sun, you know. Yeah, something in me just cracked, you know, and, um, and I guess, you know, I kind of asked why I was, what, what I was doing there, you know, and, and when I was writing the poem, I guess I was uh, also read it with guilt that I was exploiting all these images for my poetry. You know, did I have a right to do that? You know, um, I mean, it's just like photographers, I guess, you know, winning uh, prizes for their photographs, you know, with your images of famine or pro poverty, you know. So I felt that sense of guilt, you know, um, and I didn't know whether it was right to publish it, you know, but then, yeah, I guess, you know, um, your vanity and your kind of a desire to be read, you know, kind of a worn over, you know, and, uh, but to this day I still feel a bit of that guilt, you know. Um, yeah, so I started out from Calcutta and took the train down and um, along the coast and I ended up uh, at this place called Mahabalipuram, um, you know, there were a lot of uh, temples along the coast, and um, and I got very sick there. So um, yeah, and I guess that being sick there and and, and not, you know, just uh, it somehow sickness and travel, you know, they go together. You know, um, there were a couple of near death experiences and and. Yeah, I think it was like, yeah, one of the times when you kind of uh, come close to what's, you know, that you don't take life for granted, you know, you just kind of, yeah, kind of reborn again, you know, in a way. And, uh, and so that, uh, that place there, you know, I felt, yeah, a sense of uh, almost like, 
close to epiphany, you know. So I wrote this poem. Uh, called Mahabalipuram. Um, how, are we, how are we doing for time? I think fine. But yeah? Uh, are you bored or should I stop? No. Okay, Mahabalipuram. Rain, so it was raining. Uh, rain rattling the zinc roof like stones pouting the poor pate of a village idiot ten miles from here yesterday. It sounds like a typewriter too. In the dead of night, its keys worked at a feverish temple, tapping out words which rebound from the page. The trees are flung into a frenzied dance by the unrelenting drum of the, the wind. The sea, wild hat, pounds its heart's furies on the shore, a Beethoven trying to hear himself out thundering a march orchestrated by the gods above. Only the temples, the temples are unmoved, still in their meditative poise, a neutral zone of quiet between the warring elements. We are stunned, not by the heavens' eloquence, nor the search of inspiration from the, the ocean's depths. It is a gentle breathing of the towers, which sends lightning flashes through our souls. As the spray curls from temples' firm presence, like the beads of sweat from Buddha's brow, where the demons piled on their swords, we know that enlightenment is neither ephemeral nor eternal. It is by continually being there, out in the open, when everything conspires to put out the little light we possess, that we discover the stillness in the storm. Some sage knew this long ago and carved his insight boldly in stone. We commemorate that occasion by striding towards the, lon the lonely shapes leaving trails of rain-filled footprints, brief letters of praise. So um, I um, went down <coughs> along the coast and then I, I stayed at an ashram for two weeks. So this, this ashram is a Catholic. Um, so this, this uh, Benedictine monk uh, you know, went to India. He was a friend of C.S. Lewis, a very good friend of C.S. Lewis. And he went to India um, you know, back in the... 40s after the war and, and you know and then that changed his life you know um, he set up a, a monastery there and, and kind of a, a fused uh, western you know and eastern kind of ways of prayer and meditation so I guess you know in a way he was my first and only guru you know I met, met him and had, we had a chat and and um, yeah, so this is kind of homage to um, Bede Griffiths. Yeah, so that's the name of the, the monk. So this place is uh, by the Covery River. And uh, I wrote a, a sequence of haiku-like uh, lyrics, you know, um, just to capture that sense, the sense of the place. Um, so there's, there's kind of references to other, other um, a few other travelers, pilgrims who were there, and this guy who uh, spent nine years traveling, you know. Okay. I won't read all of it, you know. Maybe just a couple. Setting sun. Our shadows go with the sun, darkness trailing light. The swallows, they dart right through us. Moon meeting sun. A faint brush stroke of hills in the distance, the sun waning on the filaments of trees. On the other bank, the moon coming alive. The mind is tipsy at the equipoise. Wiring. Electrician in previous life, you are in India to install communications within yourself in a land famous for being dark. Night prayer. The chanting subsides into silence. Moonlight beating the stones in the churchyard. I, beginning, I begin listening. Ashram cooks. We competed today, making chapatis of perfect circles. At mealtime, we laughed at the shapes and sizes on everybody's plates. 
we know now how God makes us different. Farewell. The eternal farewell of the Chinese poets, the last look of, on all things looked at. Departure. Tomorrow you, you will take the road south and I head north. It won't be long before we ask why we leave. I'll send the postcards back to this abode of everlasting peace. Okay, so I, after that I went up north and I wanted to explore Rajasthan and, 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 and this place uh, seized my imagination. It's called Chittagore and it's the place of a savage and, and um, quite uh, a famous battle between the Rajputs and the Mughals and, and uh, of course the Rajputs lost and, and then um, the, wim the women, they committed sati. You know. And uh, so I wanted to, to be, you know, see what the place was like, you know. Um, it was a fortress on a hill. But the, I guess the getting there was the most interesting part, you know. Um, I don't know what it's like now, but um, it was quite a torturous way getting there, you know. So I remember taking this train that was so packed and there was just space to stand, you know, for five or six hours, you know, to just squat down, you know, and between the toilets. And uh, I think that was the most challenging train journey I've ever had in my life. Maybe not. There was this Chinese train that was, that can kind of, uh, I think that takes a cake, the Chinese train. Uh, but this one, um, yeah, um, you know, a train put in to this very remote station in, you know, just after midnight, 1 or 2 a.m., and, and then I was supposed to catch another train, you know, the next day, you know, next afternoon, and so there's no place to go, you know, and um, so I had to bed down uh, in the station. So in India, you know, in those days, what you did with your backpack was you chain it to anything you can <laughs> that was permanent, <laughs> you know. You know, when you go on the train, you got to chain your backpack to the post, uh, to the the seat or whatever, you know, so I chained my back to the to, to this bench and I just rolled up my sleeping bag and you know, and then I lay down and just looked at the, the looked at the desert stars you know, and, and then this dog came along <laughs> and um, yeah, trying to make friends so this is uh, the homage to that dog um, Deja Vu Again, I could have done this poem better, you know, um, but then... Yeah. Suddenly, the quest for whatever grinds to a halt and wakes, to the mind to it, and wakes the mind to its loss. The Indians, burdened with their life's possessions, troop off into the dark, homeward, to chapatis and chai. And I forget why I've come so far. A master stroke of oversight has landed me in the middle of nowhere, an interim of lost connections, an unplanned pause between journeys, the cold desert air gripping the old bones of the mind. As in a dream, one is flying from lifetimes away, the open space dissolving all hints of direction, driven by mixed impulses to lose and to find, and doubts suddenly stagger the heart and freeze the dreamer in his tracks. The infinite pause in the air, as if the will to go on is snapped like a tweak by a careless step, one wakes to a suspension of time and space in an indefinite postponement of purpose. Here, then, is the dark night, the desolation alive with ancient echoes of unanswerable questions. Why do some launch themselves into such madness from the same shores of family and work. Why, having learned God is neither in India nor in the heart, with all the sense of arrival erased, walk the trivial paved roads? Is death any easier on the move, a gradual slowing down? So much depends, I reflect, clearing a space on the stained floor next to a few unhoused souls piled up in need at the end of the day's wanderings. On the definition of what is real, the end of meaning and the meaning of the end, 
some run away, some towards, or there's running left in the, in the legs. A few, they stumble into deja vu, past the gates of memory, into the embrace of places and people from many births and deaths ago, into the spirit's home. All skin and bone, a mendicant dog looks with peaches recognition at my troubled state, as I struggle to work, off my, work my stiff bones into the sleeping bag, he seems more intelligent than I. A higher sense of destiny gleams in his eyes, his tail wagging as if to say, I know how it feels. As he walks off somewhere bound to a rendezvous with fate, my body settles into acceptance at home for the moment, on the move, the mind or its ghost saying, we've been here before. Okay, so I guess that's <clears throat> India. Um, and, um, you know, so this poem, uh, I mean, I felt exhausted after they kind of uh, arrived and poured out of me. Um, and, um, you know, at that time, I, I thought, hey, that was, um, yeah, writing those poems, you know, that was a real travel. That was a real journey, you know, not, not those few months in India. I mean, it was important, but the real journey really started, you know, when I sat down to write, you know, and, um, and then trying to kind of sift through the experiences and, and find out what, what it all meant, you know, if it meant anything at all, you know. I mean, as T.S. Eliot says, we, we've had the experience, but missed the meaning. So, uh, yeah, I guess writing poetry or, or writing that memoir between stations, a bit like that, you know, kind of re-traveling and learning to travel, to be more patient, um, and learning to see, um, you know, what you missed before. Know, and being patient, uh, and being a bit more forgiving, you know. Uh, yeah, I think, and I guess Calcutta has remained with me all these years, and uh, maybe what I'll, I'll finish off with, maybe my latest, well, this is the last, the most recent poem I've written, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, Back to Calcutta, and there's a reference to to the to my first travel there, in my, my first journey there. <coughs> so this is a longish poem. It's a prose poem. Um, so Sutter Street is where you know um, I first arrived as a young man all those years ago, a backpacker. Hub. So, Calcutta Raga. The whole poem is in five sections to kind of a, um, as a kind of a um, homage or in imitation of the, the Raga form, the Indian kind of classical music form, and also uh, kind of to reflect the, the Muslim prayer, you know, five times a, a day, through the day, you know. I mean, that's one of the things that you hear a lot of in Calcutta, the Muslim quarter, in the call to prayer. So, Calcutta Raga. Sleepwalking to Sada Street. Okay, so, the city, it keeps coming back, its streets tunneling, their names haunting and calling from the other side of the map's fading dream. And you're trying to get to Sada or Chauringi again to rendezvous with your lost friend or trailing after your father on the broken streets. And as you walk, your, your legs start to remember. Each step conjugating the streets, the names linking synaptically, a whole quarter emerging, the itinerary being drawn, Lenin, Sarani, Shakespeare, Sarani, Park Street. A whole strange peace descending as the body lets go of its map of words, the wonder of losing and finding yourself there, the incense tendrils of memory awakened to the chai wala's call, the smell of coal fires, the slow tar burn of beedies, the aromas of puris frying, and the street vendors' cries, 
the wonder of coming back to write an unfinished story. You wake on the rooftop dorm of the Hotel Maria Ritsuko, back from the new market with a marigold garland and ready for duty at Mother Teresa's home across the Huli. In the winter morning, the slow flickers of voices, the bodies roused to life, the stir of limbs beneath blankets on the pavement, families emerging from makeshift tents of plastic and rags further down the street from the Red Shield Salvation Army. Before the river of horns and the tide of bodies with or without destinations to go to sweep the streets of, and you are born along on a comic flood lifted out of yourself into the rag and bones of humanity, you savor a morning peace, your chai revving up your chakras, and you know you can really pause time in this city, the city that never forgets, that holds time for you cupped water gleaming in the morning sun striking sita courts on the river, a walking archive, a book of memoria, and you pass Lindsay Street in front of the Globe Cinema where boys play street cricket on Sunday morning past a dead body in the middle of the pitted tarmac and weave across crisscrossing lanes of squawking rather trap buses, auto rickshaws and, round, and ambassadors and ambassador caps to the custom house and BBD bark past the GPO, the custom house and the high court. I think I'll stop here. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, you know, um, yeah, I guess this is an excuse to go back to Calcutta. Yeah, so I guess that's it. Thank you.